Thank you, members. And this, uh, we now move to question time uh, to First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and I call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one, please. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McKeon to answer this question. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I would just um, like to say, first of all, before I answer this question, I would like, I am um, sure I am speaking for the whole community, to express um, our support for Paul Finlay Dixon, whose home was attacked at the weekend in a homophobic attack. And I am sure I speak for most people when I say, you know, this is a disgraceful attack uh, on the, this man who is grieving because of the loss of his husband, Morris, um, uh, who died in January. Um, just to answer them, we have regularly stated our commitment to producing a sexual orientation strategy in the Assembly and in the text of the Good Relations Strategy Together Building a United Community. To achieve this commitment, we asked officials to commence the public consultation process. The first phase of this process ended on 6 June last year. Analysis of responses to this 12-week consultation period has been finalised and the results are being used to inform the content of a draft sexual orientation strategy. The draft strategy is being developed using a co-design process with relevant stakeholders through the sexual orientation project team. A meeting of the project team took place on the 15th of April and a further meeting is planned for June 2015. Once developed, the draft strategy will be referred to the executive for final agreement and publication in draft form. A further 12-week period of public consultation will then take place. Ms. Anna Lowe for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, certainly, uh, the 10-year delay in publishing, in bringing forward this strategy, is a disgrace. And the junior minister mentioned the incidents to uh, Mr. Uh, Paul uh, Finney Dixon. Um, does the minister not see the urgency of bringing forward? this uh, strategy. Uh, the, the, the consultation has taken far too long and we are now seeing still more and more delay. No, and I, I do agree with the, the member. The, the strategy has been far too long in coming. I think that, that really, as we see, and you know, we have heard the PSNI even say there has been an increase of hate crime of this, of this type. Um, in recent times, and I think that, that really, you know, there, there's an onus is on us to, to bring it forward. And as I said, that's what we're looking to do. We're trying to, to get this brought forward as quickly as possible with agreement, you know, on, on the strategy. And I hope to, um, to be here saying that that will be brought forward in a, a short period um, ahead. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGowan. Thank the minister for her response. And uh, can I ask the minister, and she's already touched, touched on this, does she agree with me that this strategy does need to be put in place as soon as possible? Gurumi Ogat. Yes, I mean certainly, and uh, as I said, my previous answer, given the, the level of um, increase in this type of hate crime, and can I also say, you know, it is very, very important. There has been some recent debates in this very chamber, and also I think there is an onus on a lot of people, you know, when they are speaking, to be very tempered in their language as well, because I do believe that, you know, we need to send a very, very clear message to the LGBT community that they have the reassurance that the executive will ensure that their needs and their interests will be addressed by government. And I think that, that um, just to, to re-emphasise again, this process has been delayed. However, we have to redouble our efforts to ensure that this strategy is put in place as soon as possible. Well, Mr. Colomish. Uh, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for her answer so far. Given the very positive affirmation of uh, equal marriage for the people of the 26 counties, can I ask the, the, the Minister what her department will be doing to advance uh, the cause of ensuring that all the people of Ireland have, uh, rights, uh, have the opportunity to be treated as uh, equals in their own country? Well, the member makes a very valid point, uh, and I know the, the recent referendum in the South you know, means that really the North here is out of sync. Um, with uh, the rest of Ireland and of Britain and you know we really do need to ensure that the issue of equality you know we need to challenge any time when there is discrimination against anyone no matter what the reason is for it people do have a right to choose um, who they want to marry and I think it's particularly important again for uh, to send a clear message you know out to our 
our young people from the LGBT community that they do feel valued and they, they be given the confidence and the reassurance because that is what we have to do. We have to do it from this chamber in particular, but we also have to ensure that we, we ensure that we are legislating and what we're doing um, in anything that we do here is for everyone that we are progressive and that in any time we need to be challenging um, homophobia and any other uh, places where, where that actually you know, leads to discrimination and everything else against people, particularly our young people. Commissioner Leslie Cree. I would ask the Deputy First Minister how many strategies within his department's area of responsibility have yet to be published and what are the various reasons for these delays? Well, there are a number of strategies that are being developed, as the member would know at the moment. Um, we have the sexual orientation strategy, we have the racial equality strategy, and the gender equality strategy. And I think that, that you, we are pushing forward on those. We, myself and Junior Minister Michael Veen, attended the gender advisory panel on, I think it was Thursday of last week. And, you know, that, that, that strategy, we're hopeful will be coming out very, very soon. Um, I think that, that really when we are talking about strategies, we do need to put the time in to get those strategies right. We need to be talking to all the stakeholders involved. But you know, I do emphasise that a strategy will go a far way to, to, to help in, in some of the issues. But you know, it's about implementing that strategy. And it's not just about um, you know, me having the strategy there, because the strategy is only as good as the action plan and the implementation of that strategy as well. So we do need to get it right. You and I call Sir Paul Gervin. Question number two. Executive uh, party leaders continue to meet weekly to take forward the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. An implementation plan was drawn up in early January, and work is continuing on a wide range of commitments, including matters such as dealing with the past, flags, parades, and emblems. Obviously, the current impasse over the welfare protections agreed at Stormont House and since, and the budgetary pressures stemming from the British Government have created very serious difficulties which have implications for the agreement and indeed the future of these institutions. Those difficulties need to be resolved. I still believe it is possible to do that and I am very much in problem solving mode. But what is required now is political will from all parties and both governments to reach a suitable resolution which protects the most vulnerable in our society and the economic viability of these institutions. Mr. Paul Gervin for supplement. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for his answer. Uh, did allude to protection of the most vulnerable uh, and some of the protections which had been negotiated and agreed uh, in relation to welfare reform. Uh, should direct intervention from Westminster be uh, the only way forward? Would those protections still be? Uh, there for those people who had uh, the bedroom tax and all basically uh, agreed uh, previously? Well, uh, for such uh, an eventuality to occur, i.e. the withdrawal of powers from this institution uh, by the British Government, uh, I've been on the public record as saying that that would be totally and absolutely unacceptable. What we need to recognise here is that uh, in terms of the declarations of intent coming from the Treasury uh, over the course of the last while uh, in relation to uh, our future budgets and in relation to the $25 billion which uh, they intend to cut from budgets uh, all over uh, these islands with the exception of the South. Some $12 billion of that is in relation to welfare and $13 billion of that is in relation to departments. Quite clearly, uh, for the purposes of moving forward in a planned way, the questions that I have been asking of the Secretary of State over the course of the last couple of weeks to identify for us the scale of uh, those cuts in relation to this executive, uh, those questions have not been answered. And I fail to see how we can plan for the future uh, against the backdrop of some of the speculation uh, that is coming from London in relation to all of that. I mean, for example, speculation is rife about the prospect of, uh, for example, in the context of the uplift that we would give to uh, people on social welfare in terms of uh, ensuring uh, and safeguarding and protecting their income. 
We are now being told, uh, and there is a lot of speculation about it, that if there is an uplift, that uh, it's quite likely that that will be taxed by the British government. Uh, and you know, people are talking about taxation of carers allowance. So the other important point in all of this is that whenever we talk to the British Secretary of State about this, I'll come back at them the complimentary. Yeah. And I call Mr. Mike Nes. Uh, speaker, thank you. Um, within the, the projections for new jobs created by lowering corporation tax, the Minister will be aware there's a specific number uh, from Invest Northern Ireland uh, of jobs to be created once we set the rate and the date, rather than waiting for the corporation tax change to take effect. And those potential jobs are at risk because of the current impasse. Will the Minister share with the House the number of jobs at risk in that specific category? Well, I, I prefer to focus on how we can avoid such a scenario. And one way of avoiding that scenario is to ensure that we in this House do what the First Minister of Scotland has appealed to all the other parties in the Scottish Parliament to do, and that is to join together to fight the cuts that are coming from London. And the member will, will be aware that uh, there was a proposition coming from both Scotland and Wales that the uh, Welsh uh, representatives, the Scottish representatives and representatives from here should meet. We were absolutely up for that meeting. Uh, it didn't happen with our presence, but it did happen in Scotland with only Wales and Scotland present. So I think what we need to do is focus <coughs> our attention on how we get the Stormont House Agreement implemented. And my party is absolutely determined to see the Stormont House Agreement implemented. But it has to be done in a fashion which uh, allows us to challenge the attempts by the British government to continually undermine our budgets. And the point that I was going to make is that Theresa Villiers keeps saying to us, there is no more money. There is no more money. There is no more money. Yet the plans that the British government have for us is that they are going to take more money off us. They have declared that in relation to the uh, July budget and the further articulation of that coming in the autumn of this year. So what I'm saying to everybody in this House and every party in this House is that we need to stand with Scotland, we need to stand with Wales, and we need to be telling the British Government that this is unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, last uh, Thursday, uh, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor Exchequer announced that, independent of what happens in July and in the autumn, there would be in-year cuts to the current budget measured in a number of billions of pounds. Has the Northern Ireland executive, FM, DFM or DFP, been advised that there are or there will be any consequential in-year cuts for the 15-16 year budget arising from what the Chancellor announced last week? Yes, well, the, the member and, and myself have been uh, in the course of uh, recent times on, on the record at different meetings that we've participated in and highlighting the fact that there was speculation some time ago that there would be uh, further uh, cuts to our in-year budget for 15-16. And that has now been made very clear by the Treasury. It's absolutely uh, certain that uh, in the course of uh, our proportion of all of that, that they intend to impose further cuts on this administration. And that's without even talking about what is going to be announced in July because July is like a juggernaut coming down the tracks in relation to the, uh, uh, the budgets uh, available to our departments over the course of coming years. And whenever you consider a figure of 25 billion and what our proportion of that would be, uh, and I've asked the questions continuously, and the member has been there when I have uh, asked the questions, uh, the answer I get is wait until July. So in terms of future planning, in terms of our ability to deliver frontline services. And, and you see, the important thing is this. This isn't just about welfare. Anybody who thinks that this debate is just about welfare is living in cloud cuckoo land. This is a bigger debate about the intentions of this British government to impose further cuts on vital departments within this administration, which will detrimentally affect uh, people who are unemployment, threaten their jobs, 
and others uh, within society who are working to deliver within the health service and within the education system, without mentioning all of the other departments. Commissioner Jim Allister. Okay. We all know that the Deputy First Minister has backed out of the welfare deal he made at Stormont House, but Stormont House also promised other matters, including delivery of structures for an opposition by March. March has come and gone by three months. Has he also backed out of that commitment? Well, I absolutely reject any suggestion that I have backed out of any commitment. When I give commitments, I keep the commitments, and uh, I made a very firm commitment to the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society whenever they moved from the King's Hall to May's Long Cash. I kept my side of the bargain. Others didn't keep theirs. In relation to the Storm at House Agreement, it's quite interesting that the member is focused on uh, the whole issue of uh, opposition. Uh, at, at the minute, he uh, forms his own one-man opposition within this assembly. I think he's very proud of that. But the reality is that uh, there are ongoing discussions taking place at the party leaders' meetings for the purposes of ensuring that as we go forward, uh, we do put in place arrangements for an opposition if there are parties in this assembly, which I doubt, who are prepared to take it up. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Yes, three. Question three. Uh, we are, are, are aware of the British government's intention to replace the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights. Uh, responsibility for such uh, legislation lies with the British Ministry of Justice and the NIO. As a devolved administration, we have a responsibility to implement and monitor human rights obligations and to provide advice on equality and human rights issues. OFMDFM carries out this role by liaison with the British Government in relation to matters on United Nations conventions, including providing input for reports and briefings for delegations attending UN oral examinations. Any repeal of the Human Rights Act will have enormous implications and in particular for compliance with the Good Friday Agreement. The proposals have attracted criticism from various groups and individuals, such as the Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, Jonathan Edwards and Simon Thomas of Plaid Cymru, a former British Attorney General Dominic Grieve, and more locally, Les Allenby, the Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission, and Brian Gormley, Director of Committee on the Administration of Justice. So I am pleased that this Assembly just last week resolved to reject any attempts by the British Government to repeal the Human Rights Act 1998. We will continue to keep a watching brief, and as more details emerge on the proposals, we will wish to discuss them with the British Government. Thank you. And I call Mr Lynch for some. I want to thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. He did mention the Good Friday Agreement. He touched on it. How would any move to repeal the Human Rights Act be in breach of the Good Friday Agreement? Well, as a member and everyone else in this House knows, the Good Friday Agreement was an agreement between the British and Irish governments, including many of the parties that participated in those negotiations. Article 2 of an annex to the Good Friday Agreement binds the British government internationally to the multi-party deal, which was endorsed in joint referenda on the island of Ireland in May 1998. And after it was ratified, both governments lodged the agreement as a treaty with the United Nations. The British Government committed to the complete incorporation into law here of the European Convention on Human Rights. Any attempts to displace the European Convention of Human Rights and to repeal the Human Rights Act will have enormous implications and in particular for compliance with the Good Friday Agreement. Any lessening of human rights law and specifically the repeal of the Human Rights Act would be a grievous breach of the Good Friday Agreement and would mean that the institutional architecture of that agreement would be seriously undermined, particularly in respect of policing and justice matters. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Is the Deputy First Minister aware that part of the reason for uh, changes being demanded to the Human Rights Act is that because, particularly in GB, there have been a number of instances where legal representations have been made on behalf of people who have been guilty of very serious criminal and terrorist acts, 
and the Human Rights Act has been used to try and mitigate their heinous actions. Would the Deputy First Minister agree that that's been the case? Well, I have to say I think that one of the primary considerations of, the, of this British government in relation to uh, ending the Human Rights Act and bringing in the British uh, Bill of Rights is uh, all tied up in the ongoing so-called negotiation that has taken place between David Cameron and others within the European Union. It is quite obvious that as part of uh, a menu of uh, issues uh, that the present British Government wishes to uh, renegotiate with the British Government is the whole issue of the ability of the European Court of Human Rights to make important decisions in relation to member states. Uh, I have to say I think that is the prime motivation in relation to the matters that the member has uh, mentioned. I think that in the context of the law as it stands now, uh, there is the ability to bring those who are involved in criminality before the courts. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. <clears throat> The Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry was initiated by the 2009 Assembly debate about historical institutional abuse of children. Its terms of reference refer to children under 18 years of age, and it was on that basis that the inquiry was designed and its chairperson and panel members appointed. Mother and baby homes and Magdalen laundries were not established principally for the care of children and would have had many residents that were over the age of 18. To the extent that the inquiry has received applications from people who spent time in a home of this type here, while under the age of 18, these will be considered. Until all applicants have been interviewed, and it will not be possible for the inquiry to make a final decision on whether these cases properly fall within the terms of reference. It is the view of the inquiry chairperson that the inquiry simply could not cope with some major new area of investigation within the timescales imposed by the Assembly. And to consider amending the scope of its terms of reference at this stage, he felt it would undermine all the considerable work that had already been done, an effort that has gone into reaching this critical juncture of the inquiry. Can the Minister give us uh, any more details what options are in the scoping papers? Well, I mean, um, the, the member um, asks a very valid question because I think that, that we did realise that there were a number of people who fell with outside, the ter outside the terms of reference, and myself and the previous junior minister, um, John, uh, Minister Bell, had met with a number of individuals and organisations in relation to that. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we were aware of that. Um, in terms of the scoping paper, we had asked officials to, to go away and bring us back a scoping paper which would actually look at some of the, the people that were actually falling outside of the, the remit of the current inquiry. And they came back with a number of options put forward. And those options include um, extending the terms of reference of the HIA inquiry to include women aged 18 and over in mother and baby homes are in, uh, are also sorry, with the Magna, uh, that were in Magdalen laundries. Another option was the Commission um, of Academic Research into Mother and Baby Homes and the uh, uh, Laundries. Another option to establish an interdepartmental working group led by the Department of Health to review the evidence and make recommendations to the Executive. Um, another option was to invite OFMDFM Committee to consider and advise on the issue of mother and baby homes, including those Magdalen Laundries. Option, uh, another two options were appoint, uh, to appoint independent experts to review the evidence and to provide a confidential listening forum. And the, the last option that they, the officials came back uh, with was to establish an independent statutory inquiry into mother and baby homes and Magdalen laundries. And we are currently looking at all those options to try and bring forward. Um, uh, and obviously, we, we are also meeting with the people who were directly involved and who were in those mother and baby homes um, who had been their, their, their children forcibly taken off them in, in many cases um, into forced adoptions. So we're actually very, very conscious that we need to talk to the people who were directly impacted by this also to, to look at whatever option would, will be best for them. 
thank you, Principal. Or sorry, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I ask uh, the junior minister, in, in light of uh, the refusal of the British government to include Concora in relation to the historical abuse inquiry, what uh, way forward has uh, OFM, DFM, uh, or action have they planned to take to have Concora included, and have had that, any discussions with uh, the historical abuse inquiry being held here? Yes, um, the member would be aware that on the 30th of uh, September last year that we did um, unanimously agree you know, that we would rather see the, the Concora Boys Home being investigated by the Westminster Independent Panel. And I think that, that really we were all very disappointed when we heard that that wasn't happening. We have um, been in, and had some consultation um, with uh, the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry here um, and Sir Anthony Harton. We are looking. Um, uh, and we, we are conscious that he did do a joint statement um, recently to say that they will be working together. And I know there's also an ongoing judicial review by one of the people who were actually um, in who was actually in Concora. So, as I say, you know, we, we're doing our best to try and ensure, you know, that that as much um, of the powers as possible can be sort of transferred over. Um, um, but obviously, I would share the members' disappointment that the inquiry isn't actually taking place at Westminster. Well, Ms. Sandra, over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given, given that the HIA has added a, mod a module investigating the paedophile activities of Father Brenton Smith, uh, does the junior minister agree that it's unfair that some victims are excluded from the HIA uh, inquiry on the grounds of where the abuse took place rather than because of the nature of the abuse? Yes, and, uh, and this is another issue that we have also been in consultation with a number of individuals and groups representing those people who were victims of clerical abuse. And, you know, I think that, that one of the issues that we were looking at were when we were looking at people who fall without, with our, outside the, the agreement of the current in, uh, inquiry was, you know, um, the, the people who were, were victims of clerical abuse outside of institutions. And certainly, um, we will continue in our efforts to try to, to come to some sort of um, position where we can take that forward. Um, I would like to just say that, you know, um, sexual abuse, no matter where it happens, you know, uh, the, the victim um, of that sexual abuse still faces those lifelong sort of um, challenges in their life. And I think that, that really, you know, we need to be sure that when we are looking at putting something in place that the terms of reference actually include um, uh, people that ha have suffered this abuse, no matter who, where the abuse happened or who actually um, uh, was, the, was the person who, who was the perpetrator of that abuse. Thank you. Uh, there are a number of loud conversations going on around the House. I'm much more interested in hearing the questions and the answers. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question five. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, as Junior Minister McKenna to answer this question. <clears throat> Expenditure on the Social Investment Fund to date is £1,576,366, and this includes expenditure for consultancy support provided to steering groups in 2013 to develop their area plans. 53.5 million, or 67% of the overall programme, is now committed to 33 projects across the nine social investment zones. Many of these projects are to roll out over a number of years, therefore immediate actual expenditure is not desired or expected. However, we are contractedly committed to this expenditure and the funding is ring-fenced and committed to those projects. Expenditure is entering a key phase with 12 revenue and five capital projects due to start delivery or build in the next few months. Due diligence work is progressing for the remaining capital projects and it is anticipated that they will move to tender for design teams later in the summer. Work on achieving business case approval for the remaining um, projects is continuing. I call Ms McEvitt for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Vincent, for that, for the sake of, uh, the Deputy Minister has to acknowledge like four years after the announcement of the £80 million uh, fund that there's less than £2 million uh, actually spent to date. So she would have to acknowledge that there is multiple difficulties within SIF. And with the delays in allocating the spending monies, can they confirm will there be or will there not be a SIF too? Well, I mean, just, just, just to, to start off from your last question, I don't know whether there will, there will not be a, a SIF too. I mean, I think that, that really, you know, 
you make a very valid point on the delays, you know, and I mean, I'm very, very conscious. I mean, we have discussed this at question time quite a lot, and you know, I think that, that really what we're trying to do now is to ensure, because, because I think that that's included other departments as well, I think that, that getting through the economic appraisals, you know, at those stages and everything else, were very, very, um, you know, lengthy. Um, I think also that really, you know, the, the letters of offer and all that, you know, they're, they're there now and hoping, and hopefully that, that, that those projects will be, you know, um, come into fruition, because I know that, that there is also a frustration for people in the community um, also to see something happening on the ground. So I'm very, very keen that those projects will be getting driven through as quickly as possible. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical. And I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Sir, um, speaker, as we approach the parading season, would the Deputy First Minister agree with me that the Parades Commission is discredited, is not capable of uh, solving the parading problem and um, finding a solution? No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I would not agree with the member that the Parade Commission is discredited. Uh, uh, the Parade Commission has been in place for some considerable time and undertakes a very onerous responsibility in assisting uh, civic society and the police to ensure that uh, the peace uh, is, that, we, that we all believe is precious is preserved. I think it is hugely important as we approach the marching season that we all use as much influence as we possibly can on all the key stakeholders and key players within what ca could be a volatile situation to ensure that peace uh, uh, remains on our streets, that law, law and order is uh, observed by everybody. O obviously, it's a huge issue. And as someone who's had experience of how uh, parading uh, can be resolved in the North West, uh, and I'm not the only one that has the experience, members of uh, the uh, members' own party have also played a very positive role, along with the apprentice boys and uh, the business community and the Bogside residents, to bring peace on the streets in the North West. Uh, I would like to see that extended to every part of the North, and we're all very conscious that we're faced into a difficult situation this year again in North Belfast, and I would appeal to everybody to use their influence to encourage people to get round uh, the table, as was the case in the North West, to seek resolutions, and I think that if people do that, that resolutions can be found. Mr Buchanan, for a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Deputy First Minister then use his influence to encourage his party colleagues across Northern Ireland to desist from protesting at yeah. traditional legitimate parades? Yeah. Well, when you look at the fact that there are many thousands of parades right throughout the North, uh, the number of parades that uh, are contentious are few and far between. And I would encourage everybody within society, including uh, all those within, in my own party, who I know play a very positive role in contributing to keeping the peace on the streets to continue with that work. And I call Mr Michael McGimsey. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Deputy First Minister for his assessment on the damage done to community relations in South Belfast as a consequence of the comments made by the Director uh, for the Council for Ethnic Minorities specifically in relation to the consultation for the new consolidated primary school? Well, I think all, all of us uh, recognise that uh, the whole issue of uh, community relations, the, the whole issue of the battle against racism, requires all of us to play a positive and constructive role. And uh, Patrick Yu is, in, in my view, someone who has been very much to the forefront of uh, assisting uh, the process of ensuring good community relations for a very, very long time. Uh, in relation to the particular matter that the uh, member raises, it obviously, uh, in the context of the uh, future education of children in that area, is really a matter for the Department of Education. I know that there's an ongoing process taking place in relation to all of that. But I am sure, uh, Patrick, you who has played a very powerful and positive role 
in the past that will continue to play that role in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and could I ask the, the Deputy First Minister, would he agree with me that one of the best ways forward in terms of community relations is actually to provide this new primary school, which has been in planning for somewhere around 15 years? It's much needed. It brings together all of the local uh, the communities who, who strongly support it, but also to integrate uh, newcomer communities with the local community so we live together, we work together, and we're educated together. Uh, uh, rather than continuing uh, with uh, a form of segregation which we appear to be developing. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly do think that uh, in relation to this matter which has found itself into the headlines in the course of the last seven days, that, that there's a duty upon all of us to play a, a positive role, a restrained role in relation to how this matter is resolved. The final decision in relation to the future education of children in that area of South Belfast obviously rests with the Department of Education. And I'm sure that whatever decision the Minister uh, will take will be uh, the, the decision that he thinks is in the best interest of the children uh, from uh, that uh, particular community. So obviously I think at, at a time like this, all of us need to be very conscious of the words that we use. We need to be very conscious of the responsibilities, uh, particularly we who are elected representative have to ensure that uh, we deal with these matters in a way that's consistent with uh, uh, bettering community relations and not exacerbating them. Thank you, and I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Good morning, Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, will the Minister uh, join with me in expressing condolences uh, to the family of Paul McCauley? Who, uh, following the tragic death of Paul at the weekend after nine years spent in a coma following a sectarian attack in Derry. Gormorgan. Well, th this was uh, an appalling criminal act carried out on a defenceless uh, young man and his friends, which has now resulted nine years later in the tragic and very sad loss of his life. Uh, I spoke to Jim McCauley uh, yesterday. I'm sure everybody in this House will be very keen to put on record uh, their sympathy, prayers and condolences for the family who have conducted themselves with great dignity over the course of uh, the past nine years. And I have to say I very much welcome the comments made this morning on the BBC by William Hay, now Lord Hay, where he exhorted people within the Loyalist unionist community. And I want to stress, I think the vast majority of unionists in the uh, Derry area are as appalled at what happened to Paul McCauley as anybody else. But the reality is that there is a tiny minority who were involved in this act and who were involved in assisting the people who were involved in this act. And William Hay hit the nail straight on the head this morning when he made it clear that people should be cooperating with the police service so that the criminals responsible for what happened to Paul McCauley can be brought before the courts. Boyle for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for uh, his response to my question? And to ask the Minister, given the tragic uh, nature and circumstances of Paul's death, as the Minister outlined, what more can be done, particularly within the communities where these perpetrators have come from, to assist in securing justice for Paul and his family? Well, I mean, Paul's father has been on the media over the course of, well, the last nine years, but specifically over the course of the last uh, 48 hours, both on Radio 5 Live and again this morning. And uh, it's heartbreaking to listen to him. And it's also heartbreaking to hear his analysis that uh, more could have been done uh, within the unionist community to identify uh, the perpetrators and to bring them before the courts. He's using language like it's, it's well known who they are. And, and of course, in the Derry area, it is well known who they are. But the difficulty is that the police, uh, who have been on the record as apologising, and rightly so, to the Macaulay family, uh, need to be assisted in this renewed murder investigation so that the people who were responsible for the horrendous injury to Paul and ultimately to his death, can be arrested and brought before the court. 
McGew and the call Mr Paul Frey. Uh, speaker, uh, given the fact that this House only last week uh, passed an amendment in the Justice Bill to bring in child protection disclosures on sex offenders, will the Minister agree with me that given the fact that there are many victims out there who have yet to come forward, uh, that we should do everything in our power to encourage those victims to come forward? I wish your permission, Junior Minister McKeown, will ask this question. No, and the member is, is quite right. We should be doing everything in our part. And I think that you know, the Deputy First Minister did um, ask for uh, through the Joint Ministerial Council, North South Joint, Joint Ministerial Council, that we would put in place a mechanism where people could come forward in a safe um, atmosphere. Um, because the most important thing is that people feel supported, and those people can come forward. There's lots of people who are, are out there. Who the, the, the say, for instance, right across the island of Ireland, there's one in every four people suffer some form of sexual abuse in their lives. And so I think it's very important that we, you know, support them, that we have those support mechanisms in place. And I think that, that really, you know, if we can work that through the North South Ministerial Council, then, then that would be a way forward for people to actually have that support mechanism. Free for a supplementary, Mr. Speaker. And would the minister? encourage everyone within this House, even members of our own party, to come forward with all information that they would know on child sex offenders and offences? I certainly would. I would, I would encourage anyone who has any information on, on that to come forward. And I would also say you know, that, that it is very, very important that we are sending that very clear message out to people, because I don't think it helps people who have been victims of any form of abuse you know, when we're sitting um, and you know, um, we, need to, we need to ensure that those people know that they're going to be supported through it and that the support mechanisms are there when it, when, that they will need when they do decide that they want to, to, to come forward in, in those ways, because I think it's very, very important also that we help them when they're accessing justice as well, because they're entitled to that justice. And I call Mr. Basil McCray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I could ask the Deputy First Minister what importance he attaches to a sustainable development strategy. Well, I, I think it's uh, very important that we. Uh, recognise the, the need to have a sustainable development strategy which is working in the interest of all of the people that we represent, uh, particularly given the very limited resources that we're all uh, expected to work with uh, and which will be uh, further pressurised by the uh, intention of the British government to impose further uh, draconian cuts not just on us, but on other administrations uh, across these islands. So sustainable development is of critical importance, and we do have sustainable development strategies in place. Uh, our ability to fund those strategies has been threatened by the uh, declaration of attempt from the British Chancellor of the Exchequer that he's going to uh, further dramatically cut our budgets in the time ahead. Mr. McCray for supplementary. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister if he would be supportive of Minister Mark H. Durkin's uh, uh, desire to bring forward a climate change bill, and if so, how he would convince his executive co uh, colleagues to support that? Well, I, I see the Minister has entered the chamber just at the right time. Uh, there has to be a level of co coordination uh, around that question and the appearance of the Minister. But uh, whatever the Minister brings forward in terms of a climate change bill will be considered very seriously by the executive. <clears throat> Thank you. And I ask Ms. Joanne Dobson for a question. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Deputy First Minister explain how the Victims and Survivors Service ensures that outreach officers assigned to assist clients of the service are appropriate to the needs of the client in terms of confidentiality but also quality? Your permission, Junior Minister McCann will answer this. Well, the member would, would be aware that the, the VSS is undergoing a review um, and has been there's been a number of recommendations that has been made in, in several reports. I think that what we were hearing very clearly from, from all sort of parties in particularly in this um, chamber was that a lot of people who were victims and survivors of the conflict were coming forward um, uh, uh, a while back and they were basically saying you know, they felt that, that you know, the assessment um, pr process, for instance, 
were, was quite um, traumatic for them going through that, but also, you know, um, the, that they felt that some of the support mechanisms um, were, but that were in place could have been better. So I think that, that really this review that, we're, that, that has been ongoing and the recommendations, and there's a number of those recommendations have already been actually put in place, but we're going to be continue to monitor that. And I think that, that really what we need to be ensuring is that the service is fit for purpose and, and that people actually feel that they're, they're getting some, some help and support from that service. Sorry, there isn't time for the supplementary question. And, uh, we, and that ends the... Uh, this session and we now 